Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the Monsters. Monsters Dead. It's Thursday night. We are back. It's Bella Lugosi night. We've been talking about doing this one for a long time, and this is uh, quite the sweet spot for a few of us. And so you got the four guys who are uh, big Lugosi fans. We have, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been putting together our list of our 10 favorite Bella Lugosi films, but let me kind of with the caveat though we're more going here for bella's performances as opposed to our favorite films because some some of these films might be eh, okay but his, bella's performance is spectacular right uh or you know so it, think of these more as our favorite performances rather than our favorite film starring bella and there might some of them might be our favorite films with him in it but uh we, i think we're going more for the performance here because i i think as Bella, a Bella Lugosi fan for most of my life, I can honestly say there's plenty of films with him in it that really suck, but he's awesome in it, right? So we might see a couple of those. And there's some films where he's pretty bad in it as well. So some stinkers where he is also pretty shitty, but uh, but we may or may not talk about those. So anyway, so let me introduce the crew here. We've got all the way from Scotland. We're keeping him up late, as always, Mr. David Gallagher. We got me up early. Uh, my fellow Hudson Valley buddy over here, Mr. Dan Brown, owner of the warehouse. And all the way from Ohio, with that cool Lugosi backdrop there, Mr. Jamie Laszlo. What's going on, fellas? What's up? You ready to talk the Lugosi? The children of the night. What the music they make. Lugosi's my huckleberry. That's right. <laughs> I'll be your huckleberry. <laughs> okay. I'll take you up on that. I'll be on the next flight to Scotland. Okay. Can we there do a tombstone go. episode now? I'm in the mood for a tombstone <laughs> episode. Before You're easy if you do. Before we get started with our ranking here, I do want to just show this real quick because I picked this up maybe about a year ago. This is a great documentary. If you want to kind of know all there is to know about Bell Lugosi, check out Lugosi, The Forgotten King, which mm -hmm. is a film that was put together in 1984. It's, it was uh, re-released in 2017 on DVD. You can find this out there. It's not an official release or anything like that, but it's fairly easy to get. Great, great film. You got a nice... Uh, kind of intro and narration by Forrest Ackerman, of course, the guy from Famous Monsters of Filmland. So if you're interested in learning more about the man, this is really cool. There's also some really good books on the guy as well. I've got a bunch of Lugosi books. I think uh, he had a fascinating yet tragic and very sad life, but it's still, it's if you're a fan of him, you got to check it out. So anyway, with all that being said, uh, Jamie will kick us off with his first three choices. So 10, 9, and 8, and then we'll go around until we get to number one for everybody. So Jamie, what do you got? Man, I've been watching a lot of Lugosi over the last four weeks. I revisited all of them. Uh, all the ones that I've seen and a couple deep cuts that I've never seen before. So about 28, 29 movies I, I, I've been watching in a month. I almost caused a divorce. The wife has been getting pissed <laughs> because I'm upstairs watching Lugosi nonstop. So um, I'm almost kind of glad it's over. Get my get my marriage back on track. <laughs> so number ten, um, you know, I, I'm going to go like eighty twenty, maybe ninety ten on this. Ninety percent his performance. I'm going to put in like ten percent of the movie too because it's hard. You don't want to be sitting there watching an awful movie, so you don't want to be like bored but this one i'm sneaking it in at number 10 night of terror oh. this movie is um first of all you got bella lugosi walking around with a turban on his head yeah. and an earring looking a bit like roxor from shantu the magician <clears throat> almost like leftover costume and um with this movie, so you, there's a maniac on the loose, and you got all these people, an ensemble cast in the house, and then the master of the house dies, and then everybody wants his, his inheritance, and it's just bonkers. The movie is crazy. Um, you've got the two servants seeing the future. One of them is Bella, and one of them is uh, a female housekeeper. Uh, you got a crazy, what seems to be a subplot, of a guy wanting to bury himself for eight hours and then being revived. And then you got this killer 
around the house and you would think with a maniac on the loose, they go, maybe we should not do your little berry experiment. Hold that off until we get this killer under control. Nope, we're going as planned. So they bury the guy. The master of the house gets killed. As the guy's in the ground, they're having a seance to <laughs> contact the master of the house to find out who killed him. You got dumb cop, dumb cops running around the house. You got borderline racist humor with the driver. <laughs> I mean, maybe more than borderline, but I'm going to call it borderline I, I 1933. So. Um, so you got to cut them some slack. Um, and then when there's when the maniac is killed, there's a second murderer. Then at the end of the movie, the first maniac gets up and talks to the audience and threatens them to not give away the end <laughs> ending of the movie or he'll kill you. This movie throws everything at the wall. None of it sticks. But there's always something against the wall because it's constantly throwing shit at the wall. <laughs> and that's why I love it. And why I love Bella Lugosi's performance is, first of all, he's creepy as shit. But he's kind of a good guy. And he's always saying, you know, he's warning them. Even though it sounds intimidating, the papers, they're filled with murder. <laughs> like, are you going to murder me? No, I'm just warning you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I get the impression that, yes, he wasn't the main star of the movie, but I think he thinks he was the main star of the movie. <laughs> Always that's did. Why, that's why I kind of love it. You know, you get that impression that this is my movie. And you know what? Just let him have it, man. So, yes, I'm sneaking the, in at number 10. Number nine is one of those bad movies. But I'm going to include it because I love his performance. Ride of the Monster. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's an Ed Wood movie, so you know what you're getting. Oh, when you yeah. go into it. But it's one of the better <laughs> movies, you know. <laughs> you can actually understand what's going on. It tells us. Oh, yeah, so um this was his last speaking role. And it, you know, I love his performance. <clears throat> He's giving it his all. It's kind of like the movie The Ape Man. It's not a good movie but he's giving it his all and you got to respect that. It's got uh, clunky dialogue, clunky editing, clunky special effects, if that's even what you want to call it. But Bella seems to be having fun, even though he's really frail. But I think his frailness works to his benefit because like when he, he's always hypnotizing people in his movies, when he's hypnotizing, he's got those bony fingers <laughs> that are really scary and it works for him. And uh, and then you got Tor Johnson and he's whipping him. And how, how can you not love that? But his monologue to what's his name? Professor Swatsky is worth this ranking alone, where he says, look at him. Where he says, I have no home. The jungle is my home. And he starts talking about wanting to take over the world. And I read online that it was used in a 90s techno song. So I went on YouTube and I listened to it and it's by, uh, it's a song called All Right by DJ Tauchier, Talker, T-A-U-C-H-E-R. And they use that whole monologue right in the middle of the song. So if you want to go out there and listen to it, it's only like a four minute song and it's right in the middle. It, it, it's well done and it's really cool. And it's nice that they, that they use that. And his body double at the end wrestling the fake octopus is just, ridiculous but you can't help but smile so yeah his perform you know what sometimes the worst movie kind of kind of makes his performance shine even more you know it's like a, it's like a diamond sometimes maybe a diamond seems to sparkle more when it's in a pile of gravel so the movie's a pile of gravel and he's the shining diamond that seems to shine a bit more in it so i'm putting that at nine and then I'm going to go with White Zombie at eight. Um, I love the set pieces in this movie where the zombies are working and turning the big grinding wheel. Uh, Lugosi is doing that that eye thing that only Lugosi can do. You know, his eyes are just as intense here as they are in Dracula. 
He's almost looking like the Marvel Dracula from the seventies. And I love the scene with the, uh, where he takes the candle and turns it into a voodoo doll and then appears in the girl's drink. I mean, you can't help but love that. And I want you to know putting all these pictures in order of how I want to talk about them is no easy fucking task, especially <laughs> when I drank last night. <laughs> you, you got a number of them, and so they You're go. Doing good, so far, you You're doing good so far, Jamie. You're doing good so far. Oh, <laughs> right. Um, and then there's the guy that who drinks the potion and slowly starts to turn into a zombie, and it is intense and scary because you watch him turning into it and Bella goes it's a shame you can't speak it'd be interesting to hear you describe your symptoms <laughs> you're the first man to know what's happening and it's just so great you feel so bad for the guy so and I and it's probably a groundbreaking movie because the zombies in this movie pretty much act like the zombies 36 years later in Night of the Living Dead so Number eight. So that's my first three. Nice. Good start. All right, Dan, your first three. Right. <clears throat> oh, you know, it's funny that Columbia film, Night of Terror, if you really put it in historical perspective, it's the first slasher film made. Because in the beginning, where the fellow goes out and kills the two stupid teenagers in their jalopy necking. And he's got the demented face, which looks like a ma looks like uh, makeup out of a nineteen thirty film called *The Cat Creeps*, which is lost. It has the big eye, and he's distorted and stuff. But yeah, but uh, that's the trivia about that one. But anyhow, my number ten, you know, as you were saying before, Lugosi, no matter what he was in, whether he was on stage as Dracula or he was playing for Ed Wood, he gave a hundred percent. The bad, or how bad the material, and he was one of you that could rise above that. I mean, make him off as corny, but if it's somebody else been delivering the the lines, it would have been horrible. His is at least he's giving it his all. But anyhow, so if my first number ten role is a tiny role, and I think it's a very pivotal role, and he's part of an entourage, and that is uh, Island of Lost Souls. Yep, there you go. I figured I'd break out one of my famous monsters out of the plastic and show that. But uh, And this was my training ground as a child, this stuff. I would just sit and absorb these magazines. Uh, <clears throat> but that film there, I mean, he's in this great ensemble cast. Um, if anyone's familiar with the, you know, the, the story, uh, the shipwreck sailor, a shipwreck person on, on an island, uh, who there's this Dr. Moreau who's performing all of these bizarre, you know, bizarre uh, experiments on animals and turning them into men. And the interesting thing when H.G. Wells did this book, it was actually a book about animal cruelty. He was against animal, like experiment, they were experimenting on animals at that time. So it was basically a protest against animal cruelty. But he's in this role. He is the sayer of the law. You know, he grabbed this thing in 1933. He's playing with Charles Lawton, who this was Charles Lawton talking about. He chews up the scenery, Charles Lawton. Everybody is good in this film. From he Ming always chose up the scenery, <laughs> you know, <laughs> literally. And Lugosi is just Lugosi is just that extra little oomph that adds it all together. And as the sayer of the law, and the interesting thing about his portrayal, it is 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 very powerful in the small amount he is in. And subsequently, all the remakes of uh, Island of Lost Souls or the Island of Doctor Moreau, whatever you want to call it. The Sayer of the Law is generally like a sagid type. Uh, he played by Richard Basehart in 1977 from Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea with a very baritone theatrical voice. Ron Perlman played him in the 96 version. And they're kind of like they're kind of like the Dr. Zayuses of the creepy animal island. They're very le level-headed, they're scholars and stuff like this. Lugosi, he's just batshit off the he's he's like the love child of Charles Manson and Gigi Allen. I mean, he is just out there. Just, just raving, and he made it his own. And I like that performance because it's short, sweet, and he just kind of that'll be the that'll be the consideration at that time of kind of a superstar cameo that you wouldn't, you know, you see people in films are not exactly listed. He was, but it plays a pivotal part. So that's number ten, Island of Lost Souls, short, sweet, and to the point. Um, number nine, uh, actually a cliffhanger serial, and it is called Return of Shandu from nineteen thirty four. 
which, um, as Jamie had said before about Roxor, and that's correct. Uh, 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 Bela Lugosi played the 1932 Fox film version in which an actor named Edmund Lowe uh, played Shandu. Shandu was a very popular radio serial at the time. Um, Lugosi came in and he took the role over in this, I think it was Principal was the company. It was an independent poverty road station studio. And he plays a good guy. He plays a good guy. He does some of his hand gestures. Uh, he's a, Shandu is a, gentleman who went and studied in the middle the middle east the far east in india he's a yogi he's a mystic he's mysticism it's it's teleportation it's mind control uh on a side note the character of shandu was the inspiration for dr strange and stan lee would say that and did frank ditko he was the inspiration but lugosi comes off as the good guy he handles it well you're seeing his eye contact. Of course, sitting through a 12-chapter serial that's not like a, a honed Republic serial from the 40s can be a bit excruciating. But I like serials. <clears throat> There's my Return of Shandu poster back there from 34. Um, I'm a big Lugosi fan. So Lugosi hangs in my house. Uh, we have an agreement that my wife gets the dog and I get my Lugosi posters if we ever divorce. Uh, <laughs> but... But I, I like that because he is the hero. And he if anybody doesn't want to sit through the serial, you can find it on YouTube, as many, all these films, actually, I think, including that documentary Peter mentioned. And you can catch a few minutes of it and say, oh, wow, he's pretty good. Um, but Return of Shandu, 1934. Uh, number eight, The Devil Bat. Um, Devil Bat, made by PRC, which was Producers Releasing Corporation, another Poverty Row studio. Uh, in which he plays a jilted um, chemist who created colognes and perfumes and so forth and so on. And they, they stole his idea. He didn't make any money. Uh, and now he's going to enact revenge. So he sits in his house and he's got this, yep, he's got this giant bat that I don't know he's, he's pumping full of steroids and electric, electric and it's huge. And whatever he does is this latest fragrance that he has he goes around to all the people and including their sons if it's possible gives them this cologne and makes them put it on and he lets the bat out of the, out of the cage and they track the person down and they kill them okay in reality i mean he is he's really he's kind of like the walter white of the of the psychotic horror world you know being chill going back and didn't really go revenge but you know fuck the guys that fucked me uh, i am the one who knocks that's it I am the one. He's got those steampunk goggles. He's looking through this glass window in this big chamber and how they have all these things in their houses and no one knows about them is beyond me. But his dialogue is good. Uh, he chews it up, as always. He's a major role for him. And once again, with like Peter's uh, Peter's uh, copy, and I don't know about the Jamie has, but that Kino version is beautiful print. Yeah. Uh, is it? Negative. Yeah, uh, it's worth getting, Jamie. <clears throat> All right, because I didn't know. I heard it was bad, but my cheap. No, the print is that's TV, gorgeous. I'll do the that. upgrade. Yeah. Now there was a rumor. I can't remember this. I think it was a mistake in the Academy history. I'm not going to say this in verbatim, but in the Academy history, actually, the soundtrack album or the music was. They said it was nominated for Academy Award. I don't think it was the case. There was a rumor going on round about that. It is an interesting score. But uh, I've never been able to confirm that. That was more of a verbal thing. There's a lot of things about Lugosi, and particularly with Karloff, that have become exaggerated over the years. And they've been blown out of proportion in what the reality was. So I'm not sure if it was ever in that. But Devil Bat Fun, remade in 1946 at PRC again as the Flying Serpent, in which we had another crazy George Zuko. Uh, he has it's based on what's a Quetzalcoatl, the uh, Aztec god, sure. this, this lizard, flying lizard, and uh, yeah, how he uses the same thing with feathers instead of cologne to kill his victims or get revenge on people. So usually these people are archaeologists that are scoffed or scientists or cosmetic guy, whatever. Everybody gets pissed off; they're just going to kill everybody off. So, but that's number uh, that's number eight on my book, The Devil Bat, nineteen forty. It's a great great choice, great choice. Cool, David. Okay, okay. Um, <coughs> I um, I had the Devil Bat behind me as well. Um, so that, these are ones that I didn't pick. So Voodoo Man, Phantom Ship, um, and uh, was the uh, Phantom Speaks down there, and then it fell. So I just put Les Miserables in there instead. It's the only it's the only DVD I could 
find close to hand. Bella's not in Les Mis. If anybody buys Les Mis expecting Bella, sorry. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Um, still, you can you can imagine it. <clears throat> can you hear the people sing? Um, <laughs> my number 10, singing the song of Angry Men. Um, I'm going to echo Jamie um, and say that I don't think this is a bad movie. I think this is a lazy choice for bad movies. Well, okay, it's quite a bad movie. Um, but Bread of the Monster. Um, I think that when people say Ed Wood is the worst filmmaker of all time, they're just regurgitating what they've heard. Because, yeah, he was a low-budget filmmaker. Yeah, he could have used a second take a lot of the time. But he had more imagination and passion than 90% of the films that are released even right now. Um, that are just unwatchable pap. I'd much rather watch something fun that Edwards would produce. You know, plus some of his later films were very Chris Allo like. You know what I mean? Those kind of. <laughs> you know what I mean? When, Nobody's. Yeah, yeah, those those uh, those seventies ones he did. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all about um, it's all about as Jamie said, a couple of scenes for Lagosi really, isn't it? Um, I mean, we've got Todd Johnson knocking the set over and things. I mean, they exaggerate a couple of the aspects of the making of it for Ed Woods, the wonderful Tim Burton film, which we really need to recognise in this episode. People should see that for Martin Landau's portrayal of Bela Lugosi. It's absolutely fantastic. He won an Oscar for that. Sadly, the only time Lugosi and the word Oscar will ever be in the same sentence. Um, but yeah, as Jamie said, it's about that speech, the home I have no home, hunted, despised. The jungle is my home, living like an animal. But I will show the world I can be its master. And then he just goes, all, all of a sudden, from the sympathetic little character, he goes, and I will create a race of atomic supermen that will conquer the world. And, and he bursts out laughing. You're like, Where did that come from? Fucking hell. <laughs> so you're feeling sorry from one second. It's, it's quite pathetic and make, but he grows. Bella actually grows, even though he's, this is, very near the end from his meek and met, and then he grows in the middle of a paragraph and becomes this great uh, mad scientist type all over for Kenneth Little Wow. He's still got it. Bella's still got it right at the end. So, yeah, Bride of the Monster, number 10. Um, number nine, I'm going to go with a uh, release that Network put out of The Dark Eyes of London. Um, they put it out a couple of years ago. What I think is fascinating about Dark Eyes of London is the yeah it's a horror but it's also a police procedural um yeah in the different name in the, in the states um it's it's almost a buddy cop movie if you follow it from the cops point of view it's a very early buddy cop film um they're much more competent than the usual type of guys that you get in uh, in these films um and it's set in London um, and uh, it was the first film to be rated H for horrific, which is a rather wonderful censorship uh, way, you know, horrific, you know, what's the rating for that? Horrific. Um, yeah. And the, the American censor said it was um, too disgusting for cinemas or something. I mean, you know, it was really slaughtered, but yeah, Lagos is fantastic and again, he has that wonderful look. And it's still quite early in his career. Um, the sex is very- that too. It's got yeah. little cards in it and little mini posters and stuff. Network are one of my favorite it, companies. The network copy from yeah, Blood? yeah, yeah. One of my uh, UK. Thank you. Um, two, right? Yeah, it will be region locked. Yeah, because Pete's got the region region A, so it will be. Um, it gets to play a double role, but he's got a white wig and glasses, so you get to see Bella dressing up rather than just playing, you know, slight back hair and the widow's peak all the time. Um, based on a, a novel by Edgar Wallace, a massive phenomenon in Europe and Germany in particular. Edgar Wallace mysteries ran for decades and decades. Um, you know, great kind of stuff. And he's a, a life insurance, uh, he runs a great life insurance uh, scam um, while having a home for blind vagrants, um, which sounds like it should, you know, that should be a ridiculous plot, but it never goes over the ridiculous. It's kind of somehow stays 
sane. Um, he's approached by Scotland Yard um, about where are the bodies going? Hey, can you help us with this? And <laughs> wouldn't you know who won the pony? Bell is doing it. It's all him. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Um, it's just a lot of fun, really. Um, and it's just interesting to see Bella in a British film of the period, um, a bit like uh, Karloff would do the Ghoul. So it's kind of fun to to see him in a different environment. Um, and yeah, I think it's I think it's a our underrated one and Glad Network have done justice to it. It's a great transfer with some wonderful extras as well. Um, I'm also going to echo the guys um, and I'm going to pick as well, um, although he's only in, as Dan said, a small part, um, Island of Lost Souls. Um, here's the Masters of Cinema Steelbook. Um, it's a phenomenal film. This is one where, yeah, Bella's only got a couple of scenes. Sadly, he was being taken advantage of. Um, he he was paid absolutely nothing for Dracula. I think it was three and a half grand. He was ripped off left, right and centre. After that, he spent when he did there and he wasn't a good saver at all. So he kind of had to take bit part. So sometimes what we think are cameos are actually just him not being able to say no, unfortunately, didn't have much of a choice. But you wouldn't know it. I mean, he makes this, it looks like the Wolfman or something in it. Um, it makes this this small part wonderful. Um, he kind of sums up, as Dan says, he's the leader of the the, the rebellion almost um, against against uh, Dr. Moreau. Um, and he, he still gets iconic lines in that, even with the, you made us in the house of pain. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's able to turn just a line like that. You made us in the house of pain. If someone else said that, it wouldn't be much of a line. But Bella kind of turns it, house of pain. You know, it's just got a wonderful cadence, the wonderful timber. Part man, part beast. Well, with that wolfman makeup, it's a, it's a lovely performance. Um, and yeah, fantastic adaptation. And Charles Lawton somehow manages to chew more scenery playing Dr. Moreau than even Marlon Brando did. I'm, I didn't know that was possible, but he does. So, yeah, so that's my 1098. Cool. You know, I love Boingo Boingo, and they have a song called No Spill Blood, and I sang it for a good 10 years, all the lyrics, without knowing it was about this movie. And it's singing, going to the house of pain. Yeah, and the band taste. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm just singing a lot. And then I watched the movie maybe around 2001 or so. And I was like, oh, my God. It all clicked. <laughs> well, Deep Devo's Are We Not Men is is inspired by that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> fact, I, think on the criteria, I think they're on one of the supplemental materials. They give an interview about. In general, band, we've got also. We've got. Um, Bow House's Bella Lugosi's Dead as well, you know, classic song. So, yeah. 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 Pete, so are you, I think. All right. So, my number 10, I'm going to go with the actual film that Dan referenced before from 1932. I'm going to go with Chandu the Magician, starring Edwin Lowe, Bell Lugosi, Irene Ware. Not a horror film. Decent special effects for the time. Really good, right? Really mm -hmm. good. And I, I, the climax of the film is terrific. I think he plays a tremendous villain in this. And it's a kid's uh, film, basically. It's a child's film. It's yeah, really it's like a fantasy film. It's not that yeah. it's not that gruesome, you yeah. know, but uh but he's he, he's so good in this. I mean, he's like he can't every scene he's in, and again, he's not like the real star of the film, but whenever he's, I mean, just just look at look at the eyes and like he's just he, with the black turban, he just he owns every scene that he's in. And it's it's a fun, fun film. So that's my number 10. Uh, I'm going to go with number nine. Wilbur, come back. <laughs> Adam Costello, me, Frankenstein. Now, this, of course, would be my favorite film yeah. on the whole list, but we're going by performances here. And I think, you know, as a very, very late role for him, you know, he's playing Dracula again for the first time in many, many years. And he's, what was he, in the 60s, I believe, when this, yeah. when this film? <laughs> and you can tell... But I think yeah. he looked very at home playing the character again. And again, he's just so good in every scene that he's in as this more, as this elderly vampire. And, you know, all the characteristics are still there. And he, he proved that he still has it. And it's just this great ensemble cast. So I wanted to make sure that I fit this one in here somewhere. So I'm going to me Frankenstein. And then I'm going to go with, uh, again, this film is a great one. Uh, I think I like other performances by him a little bit better, but he's really good here. And he plays the good guy in this one. And that's the black cat. One of his great 
co-starring roles with Boris Karloff. You know, Boris Karloff plays the evil character here. Uh, he plays the doctor. They have a long history together. There's, so there's lots of, uh, you know, there's, uh, the Satanism and, uh, you know, Germans and post-war and all this stuff and, and trying to bring back uh, the dead wife and, and all this thing. You know, they wind up finding each other much, much later on and then the rivalry begins and it's got a, a, a great climax at the end. And the end is like this pretty screwed up ending in this film, right? When all of a sudden, like, uh, Lugosi's character tries to get one up on his, on uh, Karloff's character and, uh, you know, goes to skin him. And just, it's really intense, I think, for the time that it came out. Uh, but a great performance by him in more of kind of, like I said, like uh, he's playing, he's not a mad scientist in this. He's not some evil vampire. He's just, he's, he's like the straight guy in this one. And I think he does a really, really fine job in this type of role, which he didn't do a lot like this. So yeah, that's my number eight, the black cat. back to Jamie. All right, I don't think I have any big surprises coming up next, but you'll probably all one of you guys are going to pick everything I got coming, so you'll just get my take on them. Okay. Uh, number seven, the Ghost of Frankenstein. Uh, it's not my absolute favorite Frankenstein movie, but it's my favorite Frankenstein movie to talk about <laughs> because <laughs> I do love it. I do love the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like how you get flashes of the first movie. As uh, as this Frankenstein's daughter reads from the old Frankenstein's journals, it kind of ties it all together and gives it that cinematic universe kind of feel. Uh, it probably should be called the conscience of Frankenstein because I don't think it's really a ghost that appears. It's more like his self-conscious talking to him. But <laughs> we do learn that Igor didn't die, and that's good because we always need more Igor. And he still has his stupid old horn um you know if anyone i don't know if anyone watching has ever you know not seen these movies but if you think igor was just some gopher you know go do this go do that get the whip every no igor was much more than that he was a very very sophisticated character um and getting him to sneak around and wanting to get his brain into the monster is like genius and the fact that he had a reason that his body was just you know shambles beat to hell it gave the story a natural progression so you got the motive you're you're in for the ride and and then frankenstein the monster frankenstein's monster wanting the little girl's brain in his head just takes it to a very dark place this this poor monster always tries to be friends these kids and fucks it up every time um so when igor's brain shows into frankenstein monster's head it's very surreal and you got the monster talking in igor's voice which is bella lugosi's voice and you sit there and watch it and go for 1942 i can't believe they went there they're really taking this all the way to the end and then the blood doesn't match, so the monster goes blind. And um, yeah, it it Bella Lugosi though as Igor in this movie and the other movie, he just steals the show. He he chews up the scenery. You know, I said it should be called the Conscience of Frankenstein. It should be called Igor's Revenge because it's his movie, man. It's his movie. So yeah, if you've never gone deeper past Ride to Frankenstein they're all good you know son of frankenstein house of frankenstein ghost of frankenstein is <laughs> really something to see so i recommend that one speaking of which you know you gotta have igor on your list and and if you ask me you gotta have him twice um i do like in the beginning how this frankenstein wolf von frankenstein is pissed because he says, do you realize nine out of ten people think Frankenstein is the name of the monster? And it's kind of like a finger wag to the audience. I'm talking to you people out there, you know, through the character. I love the inspector with the arm. Uh, Bella is chewing up scenery even more in this movie than goes to Frankenstein. Everyone's chewing up scenery. In fact, the only guy who's probably the most reserved is Boris Karloff as the monster in this movie. Yeah. 
Um, but you know what? Bella had to, you know, I don't know how much is makeup, how much is padding, but he had to keep a shoulder up and a head tilted the whole time. That could not have been easy. You know, and and then in his words, he had to cough a lot because I got a bone stuck in my throat. It makes me cough. Yeah, duck, duck, duck. But, yeah, and he's got so many. I love the fact that when they're trying, like, can we hang him again? I mean, he was pronounced dead when we hung him. So is he dead or can we hang him again? And he goes, you know, when the other people were hung, he says, uh, they die dead. I die Damn. Nice. <laughs> <Just> so <laughs> priceless <laughs> the moment is just so priceless and it is an hour and 40 minutes you know most of those movies back then were 60 to 70 minutes yeah. probably because you know they're on double features and you got to get in and get out it, it kind of feels its length because of that because you're used to these being about 70 minutes long but that's all right it gives the characters and the story time to breathe uh, so yeah, that's number six, and then number five, murders in the room, org, murders in the room, Iron Maiden. Um, same year as White Zombie. You got the hair. This is not really far from what he actually looks like in the movie. That's not exaggerating. He's almost unrecognizable with the hair and the eyebrows, and then when he speaks, of course, it's Bella Lugosi. Um, but there's a scene in here where he has a prostitute. This is 1930 fucking two, uh, where he has a prostitute tied to a big X and he's putting, uh, ape blood into her and it doesn't match and she dies. And it's a chilling scene. The way he opens that trap door heartlessly. Like she's a piece of meat and just drops her through that tra trap door. And if you look at the scene, that is that is horrific. That's horror. That's not old school horror. That's not old timey horror. That's not boring horror. That's motherfucking horror, man. It's frightening. And he, you know, he, he goes over the top, but not to the point where it's shtick in this movie. He goes just enough over the top to where it's frightening. So, yeah. And another thing about this movie I like to talk about real fast is the swing. You know, uh, cameras were not small back then. Right. And there is a scene where a girl is swinging on a swing and the camera is on the swing with her. I don't know how they did it, but it couldn't have been easy and it's pretty impressive. So is that my three? Mm -hmm. Good three. Really good three. Dan, I'm up. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. My number seven, what Jamie just talked about, is Murders of the Room Org, and Jamie's pretty much covered all the all the juicy parts about it. But this was made also in the middle of the era of before pre-code, so sex and violence and all that stuff was not out of the question in films. But it does, it is a real horror film. But the the more interesting thing about this film that I I find about it is number one, it's a performance by Lugosi that not many people talk about. Number one. Two, it's also a film that gets kind of lost in the mix with universal horror. You don't really think about it. But also, it was a turning point in Lugosi's career, and not necessarily for the good. And I'd like to explain that since Jamie was talking about the film. You know, when Lugosi came in and he, you know, he was, you know, he was a professional actor, a consummate professional. He is on Broadway, he's in Dracula. He is reluctantly cast as Dracula in 19, you know, 30. 31. He goes and makes Dracula, and <clears throat> the film is a smash success. Saves Universal from, you know, from bankruptcy. Uh, everybody's happy about this. So they immediately push Lugosi into do Frankenstein. In other words, Dracula came out in February of 31. By April of 31, in the trade papers and in their uh, film yearbook from Universal, they were pushing Lugosi. It was stuff slipping out in the press. And then that uh, poster of Lugosi looking like King Kong standing over a city and say, you know, starring the newest horror thing, Lugosi. And he's like holding a truck and he's got rays coming out of his eyes. OK, that was the cover of their film yearbook. It wasn't a poster. 
And that film yearbook or that campaign book, which says what we're coming out with, okay, that's the money shot. That's the centerfold. That was the film they pushed. Well, this is April. By August, both Lugosi and the original director, Robert Flory for Frankenstein, is out. James Whale and an unknown named Boris Karloff is in. Now, as they said, the reasons why he did not take Frankenstein, there's been a couple, but the main one which was very true. There was no dialogue. One. Number two, uh, he did not want to wear all this makeup. And number three, he didn't want to put himself through sitting in a chair for four hours every morning or five hours every morning being made up. So he simply just turned the film down. Now, I don't think Universal took too kindly to that, but he was already contracted to play Murders in the Room Morgue. So they had him for one more film commitment under contract. Now, the original director on uh, Murders in the Room Morgue, which is going to be kind of offbeat, was George Melford. George Melford was the director of the Spanish Dracula in 1931. So you can imagine bringing his style to it. But Flory does a really good job with it. Well, film is made. December, Frankenstein comes out. Either eclipses Dracula in popularity or whatever, or equal. Murders in the Room Morgue comes out in early 1932 and it bombs horribly so this gave them two things one it gave universal an opportunity to say we have a new king of horror that's karloff we don't need lugosi and i think lugosi turned it down because he felt you know he was at the top of his game it wasn't like karloff uh campaigned for that role he got selected by james whale uh Lugosi was to the top of his game. He was in Dracula, the film, Broadway. He had, the world was his oyster. And he knew how to work maybe the stage world, but he didn't know the politics of Hollywood. And I guess in his mind, he felt, well, that's okay. I'll get another role. You need Bela Lugosi. And they said, nah, we don't need you. So they dropped his contract. <clears throat> and then resulting in... Him, all of a sudden, you're figuring, why does a person go into poverty row? Why is a person going off and working for every God knows uh, low budget film company, serials, victory, places that are gone? Because he, in his mind, he knew he screwed up. He never said it publicly, but he knew he made a big error with that. And he vowed never to turn down a role in a film. And that's why he ended up, unless there was a good reason. And there's one he did in the 30s, but... Unless he had a good, he never turned down a role. So he took anything. And that's like the worst thing in the world to do. I mean, there was once a director by the name of uh, William Bodine, a.k.a. One Shot Bodine. Now, mind you, the name One Shot was a name created by Michael Medved and his brother, who had put a book out a number of years ago called The Golden Turkey Awards. What people don't realize about William Bodine is that William Bodine uh, was probably the highest paid silent director in America. Did some... Uh, Mystery film, mystery film, the films with Mary Pickford, this and that. 1930s, he decides to go to England and direct in England because at that time, English, the English loved to have American directors there. And they all worked hand in hand, the English market and, of course, the American market. Well, while he was there, he's working and he found himself uh, making some bad investments. He invested actually in a bank and they fell into tax problems. And I guess, you know, the way taxes are in England, it's not the good thing to be. You're better off being pursued by the IRS in the U.S. than in England. So he came back to the U.S. Broke. Well, at the time he got back, Bodine could not uh, warrant the salary he was getting in the silent era or in the early 30s. So what he did, he needed the money. So he started working in B films. And that's how he ended up doing Ghosts on the Loose and all types of monogram films. But he was considered a staunch professional that brought a product in under budget, on time, and it usually looked far better what he worked with, with the limitations he had. But he made the statement, he says, once I take a B film to work, he goes, I will never direct another A movie. And he never did. He stayed in the, stayed in the trenches for the rest of his career, right up through television and up to Billy the Kid versus Dracula. And I think Frankenstein's daughter meets Jesse James. But that being said, Lugosi took that same path. Once he jumped into the B-film and short-sold himself to make a couple of dollars, the big studio said, oh, this guy's, we, we, you know, he doesn't. But that was his fault. He screwed that up. But that's what happened. It was a pivotal turning point in his career, which he never really regrouped from. But I love this film because, like I said, he's pretty much over the top. Mm -hmm. and he's, he's creepy. He's got that perm. His, things are looking weird. He's skinny. 
you know, and that film apparently may have befallen the same fate as The Mark of the Vampire, which there's rumors out, I've only seen it once in writing, that that film, although it fell at the end, uh, it fell in the middle of um, the pre-code era where you can get away with certain sex and violence and drugs or whatever you're doing, this film here, they cut by 20 minutes. And I don't know why, I don't know if they did to purposely sabotage um, Lugosi to make sure they get him out of his contract. And that's why there's a film, there's something about the film. It's there, you, you get to feel there's something missing in this story. And they spend too much time with Leon Ames and all the other supporting characters. But I like that film because it's a great performance, pivotal point in Lugosi's life, and kind of sets the stage for the next 23 years. That's that's one. All right. Next one. You know, they're not all going to be that long, are they, Dan? No, I, that was that 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 was my one. That's my one soapbox speech. That's it. I want to make it clear why people realize how by Lugosi fucked things up, and that's how he did it. No, that's all. That's your information from now on. Okay, White Zombie. Yes, good film. Love his eyes. Holds the hands. Movie moves like sludge, but it's okay. He's the first zombie master in a film. That's it. White Zombies next. Jamie said it all. Next one, Invisible Ghost. Uh, 1941. I wanted to stay away from the monograms because they are a special breed amongst themselves. But I brought Invisible Ghost in because it was for, it was his first of the monogram nine. And it actually has some fluid camera work, some great angles, good story. And then there's this, you know, he's a fellow whose wife has supposedly died. Uh, he's once again cast with Clarence Muse uh, from, um, that's rare now, Peter. Yeah. That print. Uh, with Clarence Muse, who is the... Uh, uh, the carriage driver in the white zombie plays his manservant or his butler and they work well together and basically he talks to his dead wife who's not there then you find out his wife is was in an accident because she was with her lover and she's being held in a creepy sort of way uh, by the groundskeeper and his wife like in the basement because they're afraid if the if, if the doctor sees uh, his wife in this condition, he can't handle it. So we'll just keep her hostage and chained to a fucking radiator. That's what we're going to do. That'll make it good. But good film, camera angle. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Robert, Robert Lewis. Lewis was the director who went off to uh, record uh, to film some great noir films uh, in the in, in in the forties. The big combo. Uh, my name is Julia Ross, mostly on lower, lower end thing. But that's the next one in, in uh, The Invisible Ghost. Well done, well filmed. It's probably the best of the monograms as far as a, a linear script, a script that makes sense, except the old caretaker that's you know keeping his wife uh, for a sex object in the basement. I have no idea, but that's the only thing. So there, that's the three. That's a good one. Yeah, I like that one. Cool. Davey. Yeah, um, yeah, some people say this is too low. I think it's perfectly placed. To me, it's the ultimate example of performance elevating a very dour, drab uh, film, and it is just Dracula. Um, I have always thought that the American version of Dracula is ridiculously stagey, very poorly directed by Todd Browning, and Todd Browning had no sense of how to do sound. Um, great sound director, but I had no idea on how to pitch sound pictures. Um, you still have iconic scenes, the staircase and whatnot, but almost all that's in this is done so much better in the Spanish version. Oh, I mean, they, they filmed them on the same sets, the same days, literally at night time, the Spanish guys would come in and just do what they had done during the day. And, you know, so two, two, two were done at exactly the same time, not back to back, but the same, literally the same day. Um, the one thing, the one thing that makes this the better film is Bela Lugosi. Everybody else, everybody else is better in the Spanish version. David Manners, um, what's his name, plays Van Helsing, uh, who's better in the sequel. Um, yes. Edward Van Salon, yeah, who's much better in Dracula's Daughter, um, but he's so boring here. Everybody, it's very early days, so everybody's getting used to talkies, what they're like. Um, you know, Todd Browning can't stage to save his life, but Lagosse just gets it straight away that it's all about personality, it's all about the connection with an audience. Um, and even though um, he never bothered to really learn 
you know, to speak terribly good English, um, he <laughs> understood that he, I mean, it's bizarre. He lived there for like 40 years and still had that strong an accent as the day he came off the banana boat. Um, but he, he has this power that it's in the eyes, it's in the hands movements, as, as we've said, which, as we're reminded in Ed Wood, you have to be double jointed and Hungarian. Um, so it, it, it's all there all the classic staples of Dracula are here and they're not in Bram Stoker's book um, where Dracula is an older man with a white moustache and um, the only version that's really depicted that is the Christopher Lee Count Dracula not Dracula but Count Dracula the, the Franco one from 70 um, this is the one that defines what Dracula is forever the black capes, the well, black and red in the modern era when they did a bit of colour, the widow's peak hair, Halloween costume of Dracula, you're going as um, as this version, just the same as if you go for a Halloween party as Frankenstein, you're going as, or Frankenstein's monster, you're going as what is Karloff's version, you're not going as a genetic version or made of Shelley's. So it's all about, it's all about Bela Lugosi's performance this film. If he wasn't on top form, then the film would just not work whatsoever. So to me, Bela saved the studio more than, more than Dracula saved the studio because the guy that plays Dracula in the Spanish version is nowhere near as good, nowhere near as charismatic. He looks goofy, he's got these googly eyes. It's like, what the hell? He looks ridiculous. So if you put Bella in the Spanish version, you would have the perfect film. It would be up there with a James Whale production. As it stands, it's not, so I can't put it anywhere near the top of the list. But for Lugosi alone, it is iconic. There's no two ways about it. Um, next up on my list, um, as has been picked already a couple of times, White Zombie. Um, first of all, nobody's mentioned it yet. His name is Murder Legendre. If my name was Murder Legendre, I would have that on T-shirts, man. Murder <laughs> Legendre. What a cool name. Sure. Um, this exemplifies, and they know what they've got here, the uh, the eyes, does I mean, there's so many scenes where it's just him and the eyes, and they're doing the, the Captain Kirk on the Enterprise thing of having the light shining just on his eyes, you know, just around here. Um, and he's got that wonderful hand gesture that he does to show that he's using his hypnosis powers. So do we have money for special effect? No. Uh, what can we do? Just have Bill Lugosi go like that. And that means that he's doing something supernatural. The only downside to this film is it has the most annoying bird in any film ever made. That screechy bird that's there towards the climax just oh, goes right through. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Where's a poacher when you need one? Jeez Louise. Um, it, it's a phenomenal film though and I think for being made so soon after Dracula, it shows how far the film came on when some guys just knew how to work sound film and weren't tethered to the silent either. They, they got it much faster than Todd Browning, who I, I just think is fantastically overrated. Um, and yeah, this this has been a few times. I don't think it's ever going to look great because um, it was lost for a little while, um, but this Kino version is pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. Um, next up... Um, I kind of shuffled Marge around a little bit, but since we've talked about it a few times, I will go with um, from this set from Eureka, Bella Lugosi in Three Tales by Edgar Allan Poe. The top one, Murders in the Rue Morgue. Um, the guys have covered it, so I don't need to go through the whole thing, but it's the first time Bella would play a mad scientist, certainly not the last. Between him and Boris Karloff, I think they did it. 348 times. Um, I think that's that's about right, 348. Um, as Dan said, it's got a ridiculous plot on paper where he's abducting these women so that he can take their blood and put them into, uh, to make a mate for his super ape. And you think, first of all, you think, what has Bella Lugosi got with apes? I mean, he's, he's, he's got this and he's, he's in the gorilla and then he's got the Brooklyn, Brooklyn gorilla. Bella Lugosi and apes is a recurring theme throughout his career, and I've never quite understood why. Boris Karloff never had apes. He was in the ape. Another monogram. Um, but one of the reasons yeah. why you want this version in particular, the Eureka version, and not the American um, Shape Factory version, is Dan referenced the fact that the film was cut down 
Tim Lucas of Video Watchdog, the great, the great Tim Lucas, suggested how you could fix this and make it a better film, Murders in the Room Mod. And another guy said, well, that wouldn't make sense, um, guy online. You'd need to do this, you'd need to do that, you'd need to do this. Eureka contacted Tim Lucas and that guy, made the re-edit, and it's on this. It's an Easter egg on this. So you get the rearranged, better version of Murders in the Room Mod exclusively on the Eureka edition. So it's worth it for that alone. It's phenomenal. It's a much better version of the film. I'll never watch the the theatrical version again. Where money is so, That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> well, and and it's got millions of extras, uh, millions of extras that aren't on the Screen Factory as well. Um, I've got one more to go. I don't know. Uh, no, I don't. I've Dracula, Murders in the New Morgue, White Zombie. Yeah, it's me, isn't it? So yeah. Cool. My number seven is Murders in the Room Morgue. I agree. Hey. With everything you guys said. It's demented. It's very horrific. I totally agree. And I think it's completely underrated. This is a fun film. He's so over the top evil in this. Hmm. I love it. Um, so that's my number seven. Uh, let's see. We're going to go with number six. I'm going to also go with The Ghost of Frankenstein, which is uh, in this set right here. And it's that right there. I mean, I'd, I'd argue that Igor is his greatest creation, greatest role damn close it's not the one he's most well most well known for but i think that it's one of his best and i think he that this is essentially his film i'm not i'm not a huge fan of lon cheney jr as as the monster he does okay uh but i think that lugosi as igor you know the the film before it is is better uh but he's just as good in this and i think i've said it before i'll say it again i think universal missed the boat a hundred percent when they did having a Costello meet Frankenstein. They did not continue what happened at the end of ghost of Frankenstein in that film. Right. Because of course you got Igor in the monster's body, he's blind, he can talk. And then all of a sudden in Frankenstein meets the wolf man that is out the window. And he's all of a sudden you got Lugosi as the monster and he's just shambling around like, and, and, and they threw all that stuff out the window missed opportunity there anyway but that's a story for another day so it uh, goes to frankenstein number six and i'm going to go with the human monster right otherwise known as dark eyes of london but you guys the two different names from the film i think this is a terrific role for him he is so uh just despicable in this movie i mean he plays a great shit ass heel in this and he's and i love dumping the bodies out in the river and just like he's over the top this is one of the most i think underrated films on my entire list and i know most people probably like have never heard of this film and i i only just saw this for the first time like maybe 10 years ago never even knew it existed and it's become one of my favorite performances from him and then you got of course that uh his little uh henchman was well, not little the big henchman guy right there who's kind of blind the big lumbering dude he's real creepy and bizarre and uh yeah this is one do not miss this one uh i guess a lot of people watching this show probably have never seen this film and it's the one you really need to check out so uh yeah Murders in the Room Morgue, Ghost what of Frankenstein, and Monster. What company is that Blu-ray? What company is yours? Uh, NVD Visual. Oh, okay. Yeah. NVD Entertainment Group. Yeah, this came out, I think, about a year ago. So it's a good transfer, too. Nice print, good transfer. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's good. All right, back to Jamie. All right. We uh, didn't do top five. We did top ten, so we're not all picking the same thing. Maybe we should have done the top 20. <laughs> Um, I'm going with the black cat as my number four, you know, so I'm sitting there, I'm taking notes because I tell you what, you know, when I'm watching these movies and I'm taking notes, it, it is a lot of work. Um, but so I'm taking notes and I'm watching Lugosi enter the movie for the first time on the train and he comes into the train car with the hat. I'm like, see, that's, that's a decent entrance for Lugosi. He kind of has the attitude of telling the audience, yeah, you're here to see me, and here I am. And then Karloff makes his entrance, and you're like, oh, outstaged. <laughs> <laughs> that is badass. <laughs> so, but we're not talking about Karloff. We are talking about Lugosi. Um, it's interesting to see the two of them, though, in a house like this. You know, it's not a castle. 
It's not some, you know, laboratory. It's a well-lit, almost futuristic for 1934 kind of house. It, you know, you got the the office lights, you know, and you got the, the Brady Bunch stairs and you got the well-lit thing behind them. It's just weird. It's almost future. It's 60s. It's a bit clockwork or, orange. Yeah, it's, it's what's that? Straight. It's a bit clockwork orange. Yeah, you know, that, a bit that, clockwork like, orange. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's, very, it's very Art Deco, which was big in the 20s and 30s as well. As far oh, as okay. Well, yeah, it's just interesting to see them in a very slick environment like that. Um, But it's a twisted movie. You got dead bodies on display in the basement. You got Karloff marrying Bella's daughter in, in secret. You got some satanic shit going on. And... uh. Bella and Boris play chess for the lives of the young couple. I mean, how can you not love that image right there? You want to make yeah, a profile yeah. picture on Facebook for crying out loud. Um, you do get some great lines in this movie, but <laughs> the best line is from Karloff. When he goes to uh, Bella Lugosi, you hear that, Vitus? Even the phone is dead. What a great line. Um and then they both fight at the end. And then you got Bella Lugosi skinning Boris Karloff alive. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. You see the silhouette of it happening. I should have took that picture and put it on there. Um, you know, Bella, Bella loved doing that scene. Oh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's his revenge for this asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, but it is a demented movie, but I would say it's very slick with with the house, with the camera angles, with the camera movement. It's a very slick moving uh, looking movie. And um, my one downfall with this movie, and it's with Bella Lugosi, um, when he's scared of the cats, it seems it comes off as a little bit mm, silly. It's a little cat. It's what twenty feet away, dude. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they had to do something to get the thing in there like a, yeah. yeah, and it doesn't even need to even be in there. But I guess it's called the black cat, so you got to have yeah. it in there. Every version of the black cat is nothing like the pole. The pole story. Every version is completely different. It's bizarre. Oh, and number three, we're going with Dracula. Now, yes, it is a bit stagey. But those first 20 minutes, man, those first 20 minutes, I think, is great cinema. It gives me the, his brides give me the creeps when the hand comes out of the coffin and it kind of zooms in on the hand a little bit. I think it's great cinema. Um, but it doesn't get any more iconic as this, as Davy said, it, when you dress up as Dracula. This is what, when you think of the image of Dracula in your head, this is exactly where you go if you say talk like dracula dracula you're going to talk like bella yeah you talk like bella lagosti not dracula yeah. exactly. so how much more iconic can it get than that uh and today the whiteness of his eyes in this movie are pretty frightening and you got to in his delivery on on lines like uh when he talks to renfield and said i chartered a ship to take us to england we will be leaving tomorrow eve <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's when his english doesn't quite work but it works in a creepy way <laughs> but it works man it works and you know what the older i get the less i care about it not having a score and here's the thing i have the 4k and even the 4k has a bit of uh that film hiss you know as as it's playing i think that film hiss kind of becomes the film score in a way and really kind of adds to it so, and I will say this, like I said, I watched, rewatched, I don't know, 28 Bela Lugosi movies in a short amount of time. Dracula was the last one I watched. And when I watched it, those other 27 characters that I saw washed out of my mind. And all I saw was Dracula. So that's number three. It loses some points for that second half. Or the last 40 minutes of the movie. You're right. If that was a, just a 20-minute opening, just for those lines, even. I know. Was, I, um, I do got to watch the, Mexi uh, or the uh, Spanish version again. I never drink. Why? Why? 
that's, a, that's another great one. How many times have we recited these lines in our lifetime, guys? I, I know. Crazy, right? Listen to them, children of the night. Yeah, it doesn't get what any more iconic than that. Oh, and weird. I have this. Back in back in the '60s, they did a uh, Forrest Ackerman uh, produced an album called "An Evening with Boris Karloff and His Friends," which was a <clears throat> only about a my God, it must have been like a 35 minute record LP. And Karloff comes in and talks about the horror films, and they played clips from the sound bites, and yeah, all of the iconic Dracula film. Their the lines are on the record when he cite, recites yeah. it, you know. And uh, that's how iconic it is. And I do have this. Comes in a cool box. <coughs> oh. And you got the oh, yes. Bella as Dracula in there. And you got the the posters. And then you pull this out. The coolest thing about it is the box. And you got some more goodies <coughs> in there. And posters. But not about the movie. About the stage performance. Maybe they couldn't get the rights to the movie. So it's all about the... When he play dracula on stage so my number two i am what the thing? you son of a bitch i remember that movie that's a good one my number two is breaking bad what the um <laughs> it's the mandalorian starting bella lugosi <laughs> so my number two is let me go to it here Make a pick. god damn it i put some time into this the devil bat. Hey. Ah, hey. And it was almost going to be my number one. I swear Whoa. to God, this movie is glorious. His performance is glorious. Um, so who picked this? Dan? Yeah. Like you said, he's he's a pissed off guy getting revenge on this company, everyone on the company. And he he's enlarging bats and giving them perfume. And then the bats are attracted to the perfume but his lines in this movie and the way he delivers them when he gives the perfume to a guy he says i think i'm pretty sure it's a guy now rub it on the tender part of your neck <laughs> and uh and then when the guy takes the uh i think he says i'll, I'll use it tomorrow morning the uh, aftershave or whatever he's got and he's like i don't think you'll use anything else because <laughs> you'll be dead and then when um this what and he does it a couple times uh but one character he does it to uh tommy uh when he leaves after he puts the thing on he goes goodbye tommy <laughs> <laughs> it's not because he's going out the door either <laughs> this when i watch these old horror movies this is what i want Everything that's in this fucking movie is what I'm looking for and what I want. The giant bats attacking people. You look, look at this. Those goggles, yeah. I mean, look at the giant bat. Look how he's talking to the bat. I love it when he talks to the bats. Look at him with the fucking goggles. Oh, he needs the flying ace hat, like those leather things, like Snoopy. It's all he needs. This yeah, is making me want to buy it. This is making me want to watch it right now. And why Dan was talking last time? I went on Amazon and got and got the the Kino version. <laughs> Wasted no time, here. right? Yeah, I'll be here March fifth. because so, I got an old beat up copy, like a dollar special, and uh, that's going in the trash. Um, anything else I want to say about this damn movie? Oh, you know what? It's a B movie in 1940. For B movie in 1940. I don't think the bats look that bad. I don't when they're flying in and attacking people. It it could it's a bit of a big stuffed pillow running into people, but it kind of works, especially for back then. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll do number one after everyone. So we'll just yep. leave it on here with the goggles. <laughs> yeah, I gotta leave leave the goggles shot up. That's that's awesome. All right, Dan, you're next three. <clears throat> so number four. We've all talked about it before. Son of Frankenstein. Uh, let's face it. He is, for the record, the first somewhat semi-hunchbacked Igor, you know, or a sidekick to Dr. Frankenstein. And we, were, and we were saying before, everyone covers the whole story. We all know it. And we're saying everybody is chewing up this, uh, the, their scenery. Basil Rathbone, let's should I whip one up like an omelet. You know, yeah, Frankenstein. One does not forget one's roots what's one arm torn out by the roots very easily or something and it's overly that's why it was parodied so well now although Lugosi is chewing up the scenery 
He is not as hammy as Basil or even Lionel Atwell. He's not as over the top as those two. They're great. But, you know, Lugosi in this subdued thing, and I think, you know, once again, he's in a, he's teamed with Karloff. And they have a couple of scenes together, but Karloff is just pretty much there. He laid around with his big bear coat a lot, walked around, climbed out of a pit, <clears throat> and so forth and so on. Uh, speaking of, it's interesting about different cuts and things like that. The, the, the British cut of this film um, is about, it's, it's weird, it's like two minutes longer that came out in England. And it's got a scene of the uh, coming upon in, in the bat with the child, and it's the, the little bit more uh, addition to the... Um, the butler who's murdered. Uh, there's a couple of, and it just, it was just happened to something that that print was found in England about 20 years ago. Not a big significant thing, but it's interesting that they find. And there's also a pound of that's true or not. There were color photographs taken on set and home movies. And the, the monster has a green face, but he holds it together. Lugosi rises above this. Uh, it's his movie. He really is. It's Igor. And that's why he goes off to Ghost of Frankenstein. And that's why I can never understand. <clears throat> Igor had was became this iconic horror thing. And the movies were being geared more towards kids in the 40s at one point. So I don't understand why, you know, why would you want to hear Igor's voice in Frankenstein meets the Wolfman? Instead, taking it out. I mean, maybe the dialogue was bad. Taking it out. And that's why he's stumbling around like he's drunk. You know, it's a shame. I understand why they didn't do it. That's like, it's a winner. It's Bill Lugosi's in it, you know, maybe because he has the brain in his head he's, and he's in the ice for a while. He kind of changes and like a Dr. Moreau thing. And he looks like Igor now, except with a flat head and the neck is fixed, you know, and it's, I don't understand why they never did that. And that's why, you know, Frank and Sammy, Wolfman, as entertaining as it is, it's just, it just falls short, but nothing to do with this tonight. But uh, my next choice, number three, the black cat. I was not going to, to i was not going to put any of the the big three team team ups with lugosi and Karloff in this list because i've always viewed those performances as a team you know it's a great performance by lugosi it's a great performance by Karloff, but they're kind of one-upping each other they're just staying in the game and they made a great chemistry together you know you watch these things it's, it's pretty dynamic so i was going to say no those are an entity to themselves like the monogram nine but you just can't. I watched these three films yesterday. You know, Is Invisible Ray, Black Cat, and, and and the Raven. And I realized, no, he's just too good in these films. You got to put him in it. You know, he's just too good his performance, and he's chewing up the scenery with Karloff. You know, contrary to popular belief, Karloff and him. At first, Lugosi was threatened by Karloff. He never really blamed Karloff because Karloff was just a guy that was brought into the film. When they bid on the Black Cat, there was a little bit of tension. And Karloff apparently reassured him and says, look, it's okay. Let's just work. We're actors. Karloff, they were going to be like buddies. But <clears throat> over the years, they learned to have a great deal of respect for each other. And they worked comfortably with each other. But those things like what he was saying, you know, in uh, in Ed Wood, call, say, Boris Karloff's a cocksucker. He never said that. His fa his son said that. Sarah Karloff said, no one said, he never had an animosity. And, and Karloff, you know, and the, the press built this up. I mean, they made them seem like they were Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. They weren't. There was a little friction, but at some by the time they did the Invisible Ray, you know, Lugosi realized he's not going to be the leading big king at Universal, so he consigned himself, and this is what we're going to do. And that's why the Invisible Ray comes off as a bit of a science fiction mellow thing. It's not this horror, but anyhow, the Black Cat, um, made in 1934, pushed the envelope with a uh, pre-code it's not pre-code i mean you've got incest you've got dead bodies hanging around you got necrophilia you've got you know they're touching upon alistair crowley satanism there's crosses and it's just they touch every taboo and that's edgar ulmer the director and that's why i picked it and honestly the the best trivia story of the whole thing with edgar ulmer we know edgar ulmer did the black cat and then all of a sudden he never really made movies well, he started having an affair with a nephew of Carl Lemley, who was a producer at, at, at Universal. Carl Lemley, the owner of the studio, did not want his family being disrupted. So ended up blacklisting Edgar J. Omer from Motion Pictures. He ended up doing things from Yiddish films to the man from, uh, the man from outer space in the 50s. And most importantly, 
he is known as the director of Detour. Detour. Yeah. yeah. It's the first true noir film. And so he was a great director, but basically couldn't keep in his pants, and that just you know, screwed him all up. So that goes with that. Next, number two. I'm going to go with The Raven. Only because in this film, regardless of the competition between uh, Lugosi and, and Karloff, Karloff is, is, is seriously the underdog in this one. This is, this is Lugosi's film. I mean, he is, he's this demented surgeon who saves a girl's life. And since he can't get the girl, she can get married. Once again, they didn't steal his cologne this time, but he's going to enact revenge. <laughs> and this is what he does. And he just reads the, he reads the Raven. And that's the only connection it has is he has a, he has a pit in the pendulum in his basement, massive basement, you know, <clears throat> and um, he has the, uh, he reads the Raven in the beginning of the film, but um <clears throat> Karloff is um, deformed. He's deformed. Uh, he's he's crippled up by uh, by Lugosi with plastic surgery. Not plastic surgery, but I could fix your face. And it's great to see them because Karloff makes grunts like Frankenstein and, <clears throat> and walks like Frankenstein. And then you know Dracula and 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 Bela Lugosi is walking in this majestic, you know, deranged type of thing. So it works well, and it's Lugosi's moment to shine in the film. And uh, he does a great job. And I said all three of those films together. Anybody that wants to get into classic horror, I always recommend watch those three films because you're going to see probably the top creme de la creme of horror acting together. Not until you, you know, Christopher Lee and 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 and, um, and Peter Cushing never had enough dialogue with each other in their films. These guys chew up the scenery with each other, and they really they raise the bar. So that's my number two, and that's the Raven. And uh, there you go. Cool. Davey. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking when you said they didn't have enough dialogue together, Cushing and Lee, I always think, I'm yeah, they that. didn't. But then you get Horror Express, and that really makes up for it. I love them Oh, yeah. Together. I'm talking yes. about the Dracula type. Yeah. Of, you know, um, they've worked plenty of time. Horror Express is terrific. Yeah. Express and um, oh, nothing but the night. They've got yep. quite a lot of dialogue in that as well. Um, but yeah, you're right. Nearly hammers. Um, I'm going to go with. I think Bela Lugosi's best performance as a vampire, which is Return of the Vampire. Um, I think that what I subconsciously had in my mind when, when Dan and Pete and I did the episodes on Mark of the Vampire and me saying, oh, I'd, I'd remember liking this a lot more. I think half of it was me remembering this, to be honest. Because when I rewatched, because when Pete and I were both saying, I remember this being a lot better than it is, and it's fucking awful. Um, but this is not fucking awful. This is fucking brilliant. Um, it's, it's the last time that Bella would be the top build on a major picture, studio picture. After this, it was either side roles or it was B-movie and poverty role and things. Um, he plays Armand Tesla, <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's Dracula. It's fucking Dracula. It's, it's Dracula. Um, it's, at least it didn't do the a la carte thing. You know, got to be, if I ever see another a la carte, have you, have you seen what it says backwards? No. And they always have to write it down and then go, it does, it says Dracula. For fuck's sake. We get the point for fuck's sake. Um, what I like about this um, is it kind of subverts a few things with the vampire. I mean, first of all, his sidekick in it isn't just the sidekick. It's not a clove or it's not an ego or it's not a whatever. It's... It's a werewolf, um, which is a rather novel approach to have as your sidekick. Um, but you see him, see him there looking a, a wee bit too back. Um, Princess Leia. A like, talking uh, werewolf. Yeah, talking um, right. Yeah. Um, werewolf, werewolf. <clears throat> um, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Um, the end of the film has something that I... I think it's the first example I can think of where the young woman is trying to explain everything that's happened to the police and has to say it was a vampire. And the police are like, you're fucking nuts. And that's something that always, always bothers me in films where like somebody escapes from a paranormal situation and there's all these bodies lying about. 
how are they ever going to explain the ghost did it or you know the magical scarecrow came to life and killed everyone no it just makes no sense in most of these films but here they actually have the police actually saying vampires aren't real what the hell are you talking about you know get off <laughs> you're coming with us roll credits um so yeah it kind of subverts that idea of just you know let's just leave it with a little little trick trickly ending um of you know the the denouement of the vampires is what ends it knowing this um, the woman being disbelieved by the authorities um, actually ends the film. And again, it's an hour and ten minutes, like most of these films. You know, it's rolls by. Um, back to this set, um, and I'm, I'll just do them back to back actually uh, for the for the other two: the black cat and the raven. Um, the black cat, as we said, Bella is the the madman out for revenge on Karloff. Tortured him in the prison camp years earlier necrophilia, there's aludophobia, as was mentioned, uh, the fear of cats, um, <coughs> just just so they can call it the black cat. I mean, there's no real reason for that to be the t- I mean, this is in the adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's, and none of these are anything like any of the three Allan Poe stories, but hey, they're good movies, so who, who really cares? Uh, I mean, Carlos has been mentioned, he's chained up, he gets flayed, Who's the good guy in this movie? I mean, <laughs> there's no good guy. It's a case of um, baddie versus badder. That, that's really the way you need to treat it. It's more, um, it's it's almost like, I don't, uh, not thematically or anything, but it's almost like Pulp Fiction where everybody's a varying degree of total prick. Um, so they're just they're just out, out eviling each other in places. Um, although I guess Bella was pushed to it a bit more. He's got more of an excuse. Um, yeah, some it's a masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. Some amazing speeches for Bella, and I think it's probably the best chemistry they had together was in was in the Black Cat. Um, and the Raven. Um, I think he outshines. Um, Boris Karloff and and that's fine because obviously Boris Karloff would have his own raven later with uh, the Corman cycle um, where he gets to be the, the the leads and that's a totally different film again so as mentioned Bella's obsessed with Poe and that's how the shoehorn the Poe things in here that are nothing to do with the raven um, you, you know he does start a little bit of reading the raven but again it's, as, as Dan said it's more things like the, the Pitting the pendulum and whatnot, that are, that are the pole influence on this uh, rather than now anything else. Um, I mean, he hires Karloff as a criminal, um, takes he, Bella as a surgeon, and to kind of um, keep Karloff under the spell instead of doing the magic stuff this time, instead of giving him the facial surgery to, to get away with, you know, going there on the run, he just disfigures half his face. And says, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll repair you once you finish the job. The ultimate perfect black. I mean, that's just genius, absolute genius. Um, and then, you know, things things kind of escalate from there. It's, another, it's a bit like um, What of the Roses with Michael Douglas and uh, what's her name? Uh, Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Turner. And the, every, every scene they, they come back together, they kind of escalate how much they hate each other and they're after each other. It's like, or, or uh, almost roadrunnery in, uh, uh, in this <laughs> approach. It goes a little bit cartoonish towards towards the end, which I kind of like. Um, it's a much more fun um, kind of uh, kind of Bella performer, especially when he gives a speech about, I am the sanest man who ever lived. I will not be tortured. I escape torture by torturing you. No. Okay. I love okay. torture. <laughs> this, this guy kind of enjoys torture, I'm getting there. Yeah. You know? um, and, you know, he just had a dungeon ready. Um, yeah. As you do. Um, so, yeah, that would be my three. So, Return of the Vampire, Black Cat, and The Raven. And again, on this edition specifically, you get all sorts of radio adaptations, um, starring Peter Lorre, even. Um, you get a tale to your heart read by Bella Lugosi as an audio. Um, Boris Karloff and a black another black cat adaptation and all sorts of documentaries and audio commentaries. So, <laughs> along with the real morgue re edit and original version, this this eureka version yeah, of these three region movies. Two, maybe? Region B, yeah, because again, if it's out in America, you know the region locket. So, yeah, so this is essential. So. That is four, three, two. Cool. All right. So I'm going to go with uh, number four, Son of Frankenstein. And uh, where is he on here? 
I don't know where he is on the back on there, but it's in this collection here. I think uh, that is of the two Igor films. He's that's the iconic one. I think Ghost is still great too, but I'm going to go with Sun as number four. I, you know, again, we've talked about it. Dracula number three. Not the greatest film out of all the ones we're talking about here. I, I agree with Jamie. I think the first 15, 20 minutes of the film is amazing. And then it drops off significantly from there. But his performance is, I mean, that's Dracula right there. And number two, this is almost my number one. I really love this film. I love his performance. Murder, Legendre, White Zombie. This is Harry Ray. This is great. Yeah, this is a really good transfer, too. So, yeah, um, that's, that, that was like the quintessential one for years. The Carrie Roan was the big archivist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, those close-ups of him and the eyes are just like, oh, it's just so, so creepy and just so, so Lugosi. And his accent in the film. And it's like, it's the film is just really weird because it's like, there's like so many quiet parts of the film and there's things happening. And I think the lack of like music, I think works well in this film. And like, you see these like long distance shots of the zombies just kind of ambling about in the brush. It's just like, you know, and, and I think Jamie mentioned it. This like predates like Return Night of the Living Dead by so many years. And it's like you, all these zombie tropes that we've you know known for the last 50 years or so, they all, all came from here. And it's just yeah. it's a really cool. It's kind of dated. Right. But that's OK. I don't mind it. Uh, I, I the more I watch this film, the more I love it. And I love his performance in here. Into the old film dated shocker. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, it, but it deals with the traditional Haitian zombie. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yes, yes. Can, scene where in the sugar, that is the that is the big difference. You can bring them back in pre Romero yeah, versions. He, you can he bring said them back. He said, These were all enemies of mine. Yeah, and all the, all of his zombies were people that you know screwed with him, and that was usually the premise behind Voodoo and Ting bringing zombies back was somebody you know, had a big disagreement with. Yeah, and uh, and plus you know, but the, the scene in the sugarcane factory where the zombie just falls into the press. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. Okay. Um, Good stuff. I dig this a lot. So that's my number two. Number one, Jamie, what do you got? Bone the Raven. I think never, it's never more. It's, um, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of a complex character that he has there. He, he thinks he's God. He, uh, he thinks he deserves the girl that he wants. And he's, and he's kind of hiding his love for the girl there for a minute. He's trying to suppress it. It's a great scene when the dad sees for the first time that there's something going on between the two uh, that probably shouldn't be going on. I think he's the most conniving character. He, he's this. He treats people like a like a child would treat an ant with a magnifying glass, just torturing for the sake of torturing. Uh, when Boris Karloff sees his face for the first time in the room, though. I think it's one of my favorite scenes by both. And he's, when, a uh, top. he's up there laughing like that. And it's it's just it's just great. And like you said, you even get a little bit of the Frankenstein roar in that scene. And but here's the scene, you know, it's so subtle. At the dinner party, Lugosi explains to Gene, which is the girl he likes and thinks he deserves. That uh, how a genius will go mad, go mad if he doesn't get the woman he, that he loves. And when he talks and says, and he talks about uh, people who would get in the way, he looks right at the dad and it's chilling. <laughs> it's chilling. Um, and when the dad, like you said, Davey, when the dad is strapped and he says, I, I, I torture. I tear the torture on myself by torturing you. Okay, I kind of, I, yeah, I get it, man. I get it. Uh, I love the whole idea of the bedroom coming down to the basement. I think it's great. I think it looks good. I like the whole Star Wars trash compactor room with the with the walls coming in. I think it's great. It looks good. Uh, this is uh, Bella's movie. Yeah. And I, you know, he's in it a ton. He takes control of the movie. It's probably the most Bella Lugosiest movie of all Bella Lugosi movies. It's it's it 
and I will say two things. I mean, you guys said a lot of things. The uh, a lot of these movies always have to end with the little ha ha funny thing. Well, rah, 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 the end. I think this works with the colonel and his wife asleep the whole fucking time. I think it's funny, and I think it works because you, as a viewer, forgot about them, you know. And I will say that horse racing game at the dinner party. I will play that all night for money right now. You guys want to come up and bring that game? We'll bring some money. We'll spin that thing. We'll drink some beers and have a ball. <laughs> we could do it via Zoom. Uh, yeah, we could do it via Zoom, Zoom racing. You're right, though. Be- Bella kind of he loved that role um, because he was sick of being the mad scientist by that point. He'd already been taped cast, and he wanted to get back to being the what he considered was his best thing, which was – the, the the lover he thought he was the second coming of Valentino um, so he really wanted to double down on the charm in the first part of the movie and why wouldn't the daughter want to go with him and he pulls it off you know I mean he was a, a he was a sex symbol for, for I mean, even though he was pushing 50 in Dracula it was bizarre um, to modernise but yeah he does it so well yep great choice Dan you're number one Oh, mine is going to be, although it says it is Dracula, it is Dracula, but it's more from Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein, but from Famous Monsters. Again, uh, Bela Lugosi and Dracula. Really, there's not much you could say about this film. I just say, A, it is just an iconic figure. There's a figure that transcends time. I mean, he was on anywhere from Aurora using his image uh, in models until his own son got into I've the- seen it on T-shirts. Yeah, everything. And his son, Bela Lugosi Jr., was a lawyer, is the one that started the copyright laws of using, you know, and so forth, uh, his father's <laughs> image, among other people, the Three Stooges, all these people. He represented all these families. Uh, but it's just so kind of iconic. I mean, he was on pop posters in the 60s because he's looked as an anti-hero or a cult, you know, a cult figure. Uh, back in the 60s, there were pop culture uh, posters, black and white, badly blown up paper poster you put on your wall with thumbtacks and some of the characters they had were um you know the marx brothers may west uh, yeah, wc fields and of course bell lugosi and they used to have a poster of boris karloff as fu manchu but these were pop culture figures and that's what he's become um i think if if christopher lee had only done the one i mean you think of dracula you you, you have to give christopher lee his 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 his, his rights and what he earned what he earned but if Christopher Lee had only made Dracula, the horror of Dracula, in 58 and never made another film, Lugosi would jump right to the top. And say, and he still is at the top. But you got to give Christopher, Christopher Lee the credit the credit's due. You know, the thing about Dracula, what gets me, makes me laugh a lot, is that both Lugosi and Karloff made good livings in the 30s. Um, and they, everyone likes to yell about, and it's true, he got paid $500 a week. Honestly, when James Cagney came to Hollywood from a Broadway play he was in, he was paid pretty much the same. Um, he wasn't a bona fide star. That's why they didn't want to bring Lugosi in. He was not a box office draw at that time. But $500 a week in those days, considering the average annual salary on the high end would be like $1,400 a year. That $500, um, that $500 in, in, in adjusted income, for today, he was making over sixty thousand dollars for that film, and the only and sixty thousand, he would he was in England at one point, and he after he did the mystery of the Mary Celeste, he was offered a two picture deal in England, um, for like twelve thousand five hundred dollars per film, and one was going to be of uh, the Cabin of Doctor Caligari, but Lugosi with his high falutin lifestyle. Um, he had to get back to California because he had to go see his his four, I don't know, Irish wolfhounds he had. Um, the problem with Lugosi is he did make good money, but he spent twice as much. And he was yeah. a bad Like I said, yeah. Yeah, it was a really destroyed uh, as far as that. So if anything, everybody was, you know, critical of his career, it was his own self. He knew it. He had, he had an affair with Clara Bow in the 20s. Yes. And, sp- and he he had a painting commissioned and he spent 10 grand on it at the time and commissioned a, a nude picture of her. Yeah, they split up by that point. So he described it from memory. Mm-hmm. And the artist was saying, 
So uh, I'll do this, and you go, no, no. But he was, no. he was the... she wasn't that hairy down there. Take this away. It's like, oh, my, can you imagine little listening? Little wife was I want an audio recording of Bella describing that. No, no, put the. Oof. Yeah. More rules. What a... Please, more rules. No, so, you know, but Dracula is just, you, you, he's just, it, it's it's for the ages. And although the film, as everyone says, it's it's shaky, it's stagey, it's Todd Browning. Actually, Carl Freund, I think, directed a lot of the scenes because Todd Browning was either drunk or didn't give a shit uh, because he was a raging alcoholic by this point, uh, Browning. And, yep. you know, and, and, and the, the thing is, is that, you know, it's him. And Jamie said, everyone says the first 20 minutes, boom, that's it. It's all Lugosi. You cannot get that vision out of your head. And to this day, even in the movie Vampires by John Carpenter, what to say when when uh, James Wood is hunting vampires and all the time, he makes the comment. He goes, "What do you think? All oh, vampires jump around, and run around in a baggy tuxedo, doing a Bela Lugosi accent? You know, the you know vampires are are different." Um, but he's he's in our pop culture, you know, uh, from music and everything, and so he will live for the ages. A lot of other actors uh, will be forgotten. And I think he was happy in the scheme of things that realizing that he did become an icon, although he did. Uh, suffer a great deal in his life so that's why dracula is there uh, because you it just... know the first time i ever saw the image of dracula i was six years old in this book movie monsters in 1976 I my god and the image there was the first time first image i ever saw of bella lugosi as dracula i would page through this book over and over yes it's funny how the pre-internet when you had like a film guide that oh. was your Bible. You would read that back to front, you know, over and over and over. Seven, yeah, seventy Until pages, you, and that's you it. knew films before you ever saw them. You knew them back to front. It was, it was yeah. quite a time. Yeah. Well, that's why even in famous monsters, it was just, this was something you absorbed. I mean, you know, I mean, and it's this is how you found out about things, and you ended up buying your projector and maybe a Venus flytrap, and then you'd buy the movies on eight millimeter, and that's how you get it. Yeah. And it's probably why to this day horror films and cult <laughs> films have the best treatment of anything on home video. Because mm -hmm. even back then, people wanted to know, you know, who's behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. People wanted to know the tricks. They didn't yeah. want to know that about film noir. They didn't want to know that about melodramas. But horror movies, people wanted to know more and more and more. This is why, um, like, in, you know, not changed up on Famous Monsters. Like, you'd sit there and they had pictures of Olga Baklanova as the deformed or cut up. In, in the end of Freaks, she's the chicken. Mm -hmm. You saw a photo of this, and you the film wasn't even around. It wasn't even yep. you didn't see it. And all of a sudden, there's a picture of this chicken woman. And you go, what is that? Or Seven Footprints to Satan. He, Forrest and I, we put stills up. Old Dark House. These films were lost at that time. So this was very mesmerizing if you're into, into horror and, you know, so forth. Um, yeah, but, you know, Dracula, Bela Lugosi, uh, that's it. It's the iconic. It's you know, like Earl Flynn is Robin Hood or, you know, you go. whatever. Humphrey Bogart is Rick, you know, and so forth. Or even Dooley Wilson is the piano player. You've got Bela Lugosi as Dracula, and he will always be known for that. So good for him, Bella. I'm just I'm just imagining this little movie of them all together there, you know, with Dracula fighting the Nazis. Well, yeah. actually, that happened in the Night Gallery, didn't it? Um, Dracula fought the Nazis in that, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. One more one more note about this. I've been, I've been, I've no, I was familiar with all these films. So I really went and started watching the monograms. I started watching the obscure stuff and so forth and so on. I, I was dreaming about Bela Lugosi. And the best one is like one I had, like somebody said, Hello, Dan. That was last night. I couldn't find my notes. Somebody robbed them from me. And actually, it was somebody who wrote a book about Lugosi. Why'd you steal my notes? And then the other one, I had this dream where I was going to start a franchise called Build a Bela, which was going to be a bear in which you could dress him up in the different characters. And then sell them. So this might be a possible marketing tool. Never know. Oh, the bell. The bell. Oh, the bell. It's interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned that Christopher Lee, uh, <clears throat> yeah, iconic, but not Bill Lugosi iconic. But isn't it funny that everything Christopher Lee does is almost a response to what Bella Lugosi did? So oh, yeah. Bella, Bella comes down the stairs slowly. What does Christopher Lee do? He well, he just flows down those stairs. Just you know, I am Dracula. Welcome to my home. You know, instead of the I am Dracula. So everything they can do is say we're not doing Lagos's Dracula here. They do. 
And he, um, he made it his own as well. He's yeah, a, a brilliant twist by Jimmy Sangster. Yeah. yeah. The one who comes first, and we're not talking about Nosferatu. We we can't remember any of the people that played Dracula in films, other than Jack Palance, but I still can't figure that one out. But you know, you, you don't think, but you know, the, the one to do it first, everybody has to rise up to that. That's the benchmark, unless especially if it's that iconic, and that's why he sits so historically significant in the history of Hollywood. And Bill and Martin Landau winning the Oscar is just kind of a, a sweet treat. Frank Langell are getting forgotten there, and poor Gary Oldman. Hey, I saw Royal Julia on, on Off Broadway. Yes, he was, yeah, he was he was supposed yeah. to be in the film, yeah. Well, he was actually quite good. So that was back in the seventies. Yeah, he was he was Thank supposed you. to be in the Frank Langella film, um, but yeah. yeah. My num my number one then um, is by a bullet. Actually, it's my favorite performance by Bella by far. Um, it's Son of Frankenstein from the Frankenstein set. Um, we've already touched on um, how, you know, so much of it, so there's not much left to really say, but it's funny how we're saying, like, if you do an impression of Dracula, you do an impression of Bela Lugosi. It's, you know, when you do an impression of Frankenstein, people always do the arms out thing, don't they? And that, that's only in one film because he's blinded, you know? So it's, it's funny how these things kind of catch on to pop culture. Yeah, or in this film, we've got um, the um, Lionel Atwell's character with the one arm. People don't think that. People think that's in the first film because they're half remembering young Frankenstein. You know, just like they think the old man with the soup is in, is in the first Frankenstein as well. Yeah, it's, it's kind of strange how pop culture kind of folds in on itself and people, you know, the memory kind of cheats. Um, but Igor is a stunning creation. And that's another thing that kind of has permutated, uh, permutated pop culture. If you ask somebody who's Frank and Dr. Frankenstein's assistant, they will say Igor, but he's not in it until film three. I mean, it was Fritz before that. Um, but now it always has to be Igor. Always, 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 every single time will be Igor. Every every other version now has to be Igor. And maybe that's partial again, Marty Feldman's version um, in, uh, in Young Frankenstein. Igor. Um, yeah. Igor. Yeah. Damn your eyes. Too late. Um, yeah, what a <laughs> film that what, what a film that is. Um, Dan mentioned um, there's colour pictures. It was actually supposed to be filmed in colour. They were going to put a lot of money into this. Um, but Jack uh, Pierce could not get the, the makeup to look good, just could not do it. So the studio said, mm, okay, we're not going to do it then. But because that's going to save us quite a lot of money, you can have an extra half hour and we'll put this out as an A picture. So that's the reason why it's much longer. And it really needs it because this is kind of where the films stop being uh the the thing is the studio have to make to turn a profit that they're a bit ashamed of and it starts to become prestige pictures for the for the studio they would turn away from that quite quickly after the wolfman and things but this i mean to put basil rathbone in he was just coming off uh, robin hood um as, as the sheriff he was just coming off the first two sherlock holmes films so he is Hollywood superstar at this point um, and here he is in the third Frankenstein film um, so it's not a case of just getting oh it doesn't matter just be actors it doesn't matter they're getting the biggest actor they can at this point to be the new Frankenstein and again he's playing that character who's almost like Gene Wilder's character in in Young Frankenstein, who's the kind of naive, I'm um, ashamed of my name and you know blah 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 and as Jamie rightly said Igor is not the guy that gets whipped around and told what to do. He's the one with agency in this film, and he's the one who's pulling the well, Bella, pull the string, pull the string. He's literally pulling the strings of oh, everything that goes on in this film. Um, he he's playing Frankenstein. You know, yeah. If, if you really wanted to get your family name back, you know. You could always finish those experiments. You know, your, your grandfather never did really perfect it. Wouldn't it be nice if you could, you know, he's brewing it so on the seed, be so slimy and seedy at the same time. And, you know, he's, he's disgusting, he's creepy, he's nasty. Um, Bella completely tears it up in that film. Um, and, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's possibly, possibly the best performance he gave. It's not the most iconic 
and I don't think he would want to be remembered for anything involving a franchise more synonymous with, with, with Karloff. Um, but it's, I think because he's in a film of someone else's franchise who had a friendly rivalry with verging on slight rivalry, um, I think he gives it even more. I think when you put someone against their, <clears throat> not nemesis, but when against their rival, that kind of pushes them to one up each other. And I think that's there in all the collaboration films, really. You can see that Bella is going, I'm going to outdo Karloff here. I'm really going to outdo Karloff. And to be honest, he does every single time for me. He absolutely wipes the floor with Boris Karloff, who, to be fair to him, isn't particularly trying in a lot of them to, to do that back. Um, I think he, I think he's more reserved. And Kar- Karloff checked out the Frankenstein rule by this point he's not interested he's by this point he's already been offered um the stage part in um um blood and black lace yeah uh, uh, yeah yeah that'll do (laughs) and then he was supposed he was supposed to be in the film version arsenic and um old lace lace, and then they couldn't get him for that because he was tied up to another horror movie so when they have a character who looks a bit like him they say you look a bit like Boris Karloff. So, you know, it's funny how film even back then was so meta and referential. We think that's a very postmodern thing for referencing other films and, and uh, talk, you know, breaking the fourth wall. They were doing it in the 40s, the 30s, practically, it was so early. So, I mean, it's a stunning performance from Bela Lugosi. I don't think he ever talked it in terms of just stealing the show. Dracula, he may have led the show. But here he comes in and steals it. I think he just says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come in. I've got Hollywood royalty around me everywhere I look. I've got Karloff. I've got Lionel Atwell. And I've got Basil Rathbone. Fuck the lot of them. I'm going to steal this whole movie. And it absolutely does. Everyone who watches it comes away saying Igor is the best thing in it. So, yeah, Bella won the day for me. And this is great. great performance. Yeah. Like I, I, I would agree with. That. I still think I think it's his his best character by far. All right, but my number one has to be the Raven. I think that is Professor Valen is his greatest. He, Igor might be his greatest character. I think Valen is his most despicable character even more so than Igor. And he is so over the top. And I'm going to mention again, the scene that Jamie mentioned before, where he's got um, Bateman is in the, uh, the, the room and Bella as Valen is up top. This is after the surgery. And now <coughs> it's like, now Bateman, you're ugly. Right. And he's maniacally laughing. And, you know, Bateman is like looking at himself in the mirror. He's smashing the mirrors. And he's looking back up and he's just cackling up above. It just, it's, awesome so good he is just so over the top evil in this film uh there's no way this couldn't be my number one and i i I love this movie i think this is the best pairing of the two of them uh they're both great in it the the, the black hat is great too but i i think uh and uh, davy i will agree with you i think every time that these two guys had filmed together where the roles were fairly equal i think that lugosi knocks it out of the park yeah. every single time it's something something about it you know later on they'd be in films together but Lagos would have these little minor films the body snatcher and things body yeah. snatcher is the perfect example yeah. for that yeah but the body snatcher that scene the body snatcher is still watching the two of them work it's, it's great it's, yeah you know, it's it's yeah. great it's it's better than henry danielle and everybody else in the film yeah he's, he's, he's not got enough to steal anything though yeah. yeah yeah uh and they worked well together you can see they respected each other's talent that's one thing about them. i mean uh, lugosi never really socialized outside of his hungarian community in, in hollywood as did carlop carlop was you know didn't play yeah, he played the british community yeah you know, the english actors society that yeah, they, had. they didn't uh you know they didn't they didn't really play the in network through yeah. Hollywood in the main studio. And then again, being a universal, they were never invited to big parties. Like the three stooges that one thing one of the three stooges said one time, he goes, Yeah, we one thing we can be sure of in Hollywood, we'll never be invited to Louis B. Mayer's house for a cookout. You know, uh, because it, you were you were in a you were in a lesser studio. And uh that's unfortunate, but that's they didn't really socialize and together or in the same same circus, but they respected each other on stage. 
Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize about Karloff, not to cut you off, Pete, but is that when Lugosi got Dracula, he was the top of his game. This was it. And then he started to slide. Karloff, okay, had had, a, had almost up to 70 films under his belt, right? He was driving a truck and, and carrying cement bags as a laborer to compensate to pay his bills. You know, so when they sit there and they say, you're going to have to sit four hours on your ass in a chair and apply makeup, he's like, I'm in. It's better than yeah. flipping uh, cement bags. James, James yeah. Wales saw, saw him in the canteen, didn't he? And, that was how he, that's how he and the, cr- the criminal the code got him that notice, too. Criminal code by Howard Hawks, yeah. yeah. That thing. But yeah. Uh, anyhow, just had to throw as much trivia as I could. Sorry. So a lot, a lot of good roles here, a lot of good films. You know, there's some that we didn't, uh, that didn't kind of come up here. Uh, you know, Voodoo Man is actually kind of fun. The Ape Man, Man is, is, is Man. terrible, but it's kind of fun. The Mysterious Black Friday. Movie. What's that? Black Friday. Black yeah. Friday, The Invisible Ray. You got the Phantom Mr. Ship. Long, Mr. Phantom Wong, Mr. Wong. Phantom, Phantom Ship. Now, right, Davey, that the British front print is still lost, right? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. And, and by God, I wish we could find that. It is a good film, but knowing that there's a much better film that's probably a turn to vinegar, hmm, damn. I know. Yeah, I mean, he's he's yeah. good at international house. He holds his own. In comedy. Uh, Invisible Ray and Black Friday there in the Eureka version. Death Kiss is kind of interesting. Yeah, there, there's there's a whole bunch of other ones, but uh, I think we we got the cream of the crop. I think we, we Le Miserable, of course. Of course. Uh, of course. Yeah. And don't you know, don't uh, and don't uh, don't short sell. He actually played comedy and he played this. And you know, he's in International House with W. C. Fields. It's Paramount. Yeah. He's in Broad Minded <laughs> with. Joe E. Brown and Thelma Todd, small roles. Charlie Early. Chan. Mm-hmm. And he, he's quite good in them. You know, whatever. You, and uh, Ninochka with, uh, he plays the uh, Russian. Yeah, Greg, Greg Arbo, yeah. And it's a great yeah. scene. Uh, you know, he plays like a Russian uh, head of the police, I think. And, you know, Greta Garbo is a Russian spy who's trying to. He, he thought that was going to be his his come big back. comeback. That was, a, um, that was an MGM. That's prestige. For for Ernst Lubitsch to be cast in Bela Lugosi, he thought Greta Garbo, Ernst Lubitsch, I'm oh. back, baby. Oh, that didn't happen, unfortunately. He was phonetically learning even lines on the Black Cat. That's where that's where Karloff became kind of sympathetic to him. Yeah, he realized this guy not only is learning his lines, he has to learn them phonetically, and that's why his speech. And one thing about Hungarian is that it's not a romantic language. And even like Paul Lucas, who was Hungarian, you never lose that accent. There's something about the language itself. No matter how hard you try, you're going to have a certain... Because Paul Lucas sounds just like Bud Lugosi. If you listen to Paul Lucas and the Ghostbreakers of Bob Hope, or any number of films he appeared in, he has the same exact inflection in his voice as Lugosi. So. Crazy stuff. <clears throat> All, right. All right. So there you have it, everybody. Our 10 favorite Bela Lugosi films. Uh, list your favorites down in the comments below. And visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together. All the damn all time. All the damn Stay time. Tuned. Back right. here on the Monsters Den in two weeks, where we will have our review of the new film, Megan. Right? Oh, my wife will be so happy. You just got to watch one movie, hon. Just one movie. See that? <laughs> <laughs> what I can say is this supernatural, perhaps baloney, perhaps not. <laughs> That's right. So uh thanks for watching everybody for Jamie Lazo, Dan Brown, and Davy Gallagher, I am P Pardo. Thanks for watching us here on the Monsters Den. We'll see you real soon. Take good care. night, all. Bye-bye. <laughs>